and welcome to First Friday Fertility Live. I'm Dr. John Preston Perry and I am here talking about the periscope technique. So we are going to be talking about how do you go about seeing if you can get pregnant? What are the core building blocks for female fertility and how do you do it in a single visit? But let's move on now to the periscope technique. Now, first of all, th this is something that I'm sure uh, legal would want me to say for everything that uh, beyond the fact that all of this is general advice and of course you want to um, find whether it applies personally to you. So talk to a clinician before pursuing any course of clinical action, but also um, Periscope as a trademark, um, the, there is a trademark relating to minimally invasive surgical services, which we uh, do. There's a trademark relating to a website that talks about it. And uh, there's also one for uh, instruments uh, th that are used for evaluating the gynecologic uh, anatomy. So there are all kinds of things that relate to that. The periscope technique, um, as it's alluded to, um, which we pioneered and is sort of known for us, um, it's, the technique is known for using air-infused saline at hysteroscopy to see if the tubes are open. And I'll explain all that. And then the broader approach is how you combine that with ultrasound to sort of have a broader context for female fertility. And so here's a thing I always emphasize for people. I always say fertility isn't easy, but it's simple. It boils down to four things. A guy has to have sperm, woman has to have eggs, they've got to meet in the tubes and have a place to go in the uterus. It's not that there aren't things that aren't incorporated in that, but I often ask the MA for about 90, 95% of the things that are common and readily detectable, it will fall into one of those four categories. And so if you have a good grasp on those, and I think that still, you know, it's still hard to pick up stage one endometriosis, although that's in a category by itself at stage two, um, you know, at the same time, if you can understand those well, you can often figure out the essentials for um, helping people conceive. So we'll um, talk a lot about that. And so how you do, we look at a sort of a systematic approach to fertility testing. Ultrasound, if you are counting the number of eggs that are in the ovary, this is called the antral follicle count. Now the ovary normally looks like a chocolate chip cookie. You'll see the circular structure, a lot of little black spots going all the way around. Looks like a chocolate chip cookie. The more chips, the better the cookie. The more black spots we see, the more eggs you have, the better off you are. And so the ultrasound can really give a realistic and reasonable predictor of ovarian reserve. And again, ult, you know, if you use FSH, we often refer to that as a test of the past. So the antral follicle count um, is uh, very uh, favorable. By the way, I'm going to occasionally send out the love and chat to all the people who are logging on saying hi. So I appreciate everyone who uh, tunes in for these videos. And please comment and say anything that you feel relevant and supportive of uh, you know this community. We want a supportive environment for all the people on their journey. Um, so we, we figure out where those are and we can predict whether a person's 30 or whether the ovaries may be 30, but acting like they're 40 or whether they're acting like they're 20, where people have more robust reserve. But if you combine an antral follicle count with um, a person's age, you can figure out most of what you need for ovarian reserve. Not that there aren't exceptions. Nothing for any test is 100% in f the field of fertility or for medicine in general. Um, but for the most part, um, you can figure out uh, for almost uh, all patients, you'll have a reasonable estimate as long as you can know their age and see their ovaries well with which to get an antral follicle count. And there are some rare exceptions. The next is also for looking at the uterus. Ultrasound is very good for the outer uterus, but for the inner uterus where pregnancy develops, there are often things that are hard to see with ultrasound. Ultrasound can often be better for fibroids, which take up a lot of space, generate a lot of signal. You can even see for larger polyps um, that are, are picked up with ultrasound. But the thing is, if the polyp tends to be in the corner of the uterus where the tubes connect, that's very easy for the um, ultrasound to miss. You have 
infections, you, which is chronic endometritis. And there are changes you can see for the uterus that are often missed with that. And you can also see um, that um, there can be scarring. Even Asherman syndrome, you would think you would pick that up where the top and the bottom of the uterus fuse together. That also can be missed. And hysteroscopy will pick that up. Now for hysteroscopy, everyone reads online about these really large, painful cameras and they kind of freak out. We use really small cameras. The focus that I use is a 2.8 millimeter flexible hysteroscope. So I always joke, it's small enough to go in the male bladder in the office without anesthesia. Um, if it can go in the guy's anatomy, most women can handle it well. There are some rare cases, uh, or I would say, you know, most women do very well. Uh, you know, most people compare this to a pap smear or less for the degree of discomfort. The core people where you see more discomfort is if they have baseline discomfort. So they have a stage four endometriosis where they need pelvic rehabilitation uh, therapy for the pelvis. Or they've just, you know, I've had a person recently where she had to go to the ER for every single period that she had, or m many of them are routinely. You know, when people have such extreme issues for the pelvis, um, most of the things that are done for it uh, can cause a degree of discomfort. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, that, that's not specific um, to just um, this particular test. The other thing where you watch a little bit more for that may be more specific is two things. If the tubes are closed and the cervix are closed, it makes things more uncomfortable because if you're putting fluid in and it can't get out, these cause a greater degree of discomfort. Think of when you are, so I always say, you know, think of Thanksgiving dinner, you know, if you're normally eating and you're over full, you know, you're uncomfortable, but if you're really, really stuffed, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, it's not over when you're full, it's over when you're ashamed of yourself. You know, if you are having the cervix closed off, so there's a tight seal, so if this is the hysteroscope and it's going around, and it's a very tight seal relative to if it's more open and fluid can come around in this space and get out, that makes things a bit more uncomfortable. So if you have a tight seal, that makes it very hard. And then if the tubes are closed, that's like a balloon where it stretches and things go in and they can't get out. So you usually are watching for that tight seal for people who've had previous chlamydia or they've had previous freezing of the cervix or some people just naturally have it. And then people who've had tubal ligation or they've had, again, pelvic inflammatory disease or extensive endometriosis, which have closed off the tubes. Those are all things that are meaningful risk factors um, that make it hard um, for fluid to get where it needs to be. And that can, those can cause discomfort. Most people um, do reasonably well. And then also there can be cramping again if you are, have this, the cervix closed off and you have to open it up. But that's where you're trying to fix it. Uh, and most people, again, if you want to be really comfortable for that, you get anesthesia, you're out cold, you're asleep. Um, but most people say, hey, that's $1,000, $2,000 going to the OR or getting anesthesia. If you can have it crampy for 30, 60 seconds with a dilation, um, save the money for $1,000, $2,000. Bucks. And most people will uh, do that. But again, I think it's individualized and you have to find your own comfort level. Anyway, when once you're in the uterus and you're finding all these things um, that are sort of, you know, potentially going on, you want to try to fix it and um, see as much as you can for what things are normal. And then that gives you a really good sense for what you have to do about it. Now let me show what it looks like for the inside of the uterus. So this here, I'm going to try to zoom in for the monitor here. So hopefully we've got things there. Let's see here. And so this is, a, so right in here, this is the cervix. So the gateway from the vagina to the uterus. We're coming along and into the uterine cavity here. And uh, so it's advancing along and I'm just going along the cervix with this very small camera. And right up in here as a about to get here, it's a little narrow at the inner os to connect to the uterus, but now we're coming into the uterine cavity. So this is where a baby grows in here. And what you'll see is there are these two bumps. There's one right up here and then there's one right up here. The rest of this uterine cavity, things are very smooth and I apologize for everything moving around a little bit for it. Um, but you see these bumps here. Those are polyps. Now polyps, um, if they are in the wrong place, they can actually decrease your fertility. And adjusting the, t the um, screen here, 
So you want to actually figure out when you have growths like this for two reasons. One, they can progress and they can become cancer, and which is obviously not anything anyone wants uh, for things. The other reason beyond the fact that they have a degree of cancer risk is that people believe that if they're, they bleed, they can irritate the lining and then that can lead um, to a less hospitable place for pregnancy. In fact, the one randomized control trial called Perez Medina showed that if you remove polyps, people were about three times as fertile in subsequent months. By the way, we're adding air bubbles. You're seeing them zip out each corner. That's where the fallopian tubes were connected and then we were done there. So, um, so we were just seeing whether the tubes were open there on top of um, the fact that we found something that could potentially result in cancer if ignored as well as distracting from fertility. So that was a quick um, approach. We also did it vaginoscopically, so we didn't have um, a, um, a so we didn't use a speculum for doing that. Um, I didn't point that out, but let me just show you another person. This was a person who had had a miscarriage and had a DNC, and the inside of the uterus was sort of scarred as a result. Now, that normally doesn't happen. Most of the time after a DNC, people are fine, but you see this band that's fused here in the center where the front and the back of the uterus have fused, that's bad. You don't want that. That's sort of taking away the space. And if an embryo were to implant in this area, it wouldn't be able to attach as well because it doesn't have the normal blood supply. So there's a band that's right here. And I'm seeing the fallopian tube connect in this corner back here uh, on either side as I sort of roll the hysteroscope around that band. It's right up in that corner. I'm just sort of coming back, looking more at the rest of the uterine cavity. Again, there's a band here, there's a band here. I'm actually coming down now to this other side. Um, in a second. Sorry if I anyone's motion sick from this. Um, there's a band here, there's a band here. Um, all these bands, um, you know, uh, it's uh, unfortunate to see these many for things. All of these are sort of detracting from pregnancy and making it hard for this person to conceive. And she'd actually had multiple failed um, pregnancies previously. Um, and then when we were able to remove things, um, she uh, did better. So this is really important. This is a person actually for this video where this person had recurrent miscarriages and nobody had picked this up, but you see this growth that, where there's sort of these fronds and everything in the middle. This is actually retained placenta from a previous pregnancy. And it was inflaming the uterus where it made it very hard for a future pregnancy to develop. There, by the way, there's some small micro polyps there. Let me just go back and show those. Um, again, sometimes, let's move back. Sometimes these can overlap with a chronic infection. Um, and so they're, they're right here, here, here. Um, that may or may not be the case. She's got so much inflammation going on throughout the uterus, but she absolutely needs this out with which to be able to get pregnant. And then the final video I had for this was just, this was a person, as we talk about things, um, where she'd had, um, this is, again, just going into, we were finding the cervix, here we go. Takes a second, I'm just finding the angle. Oh, I'll tell you what, um, that doesn't really help you. But this is vaginoscopy, again, where you don't use a speculum to make things more gentle. And you're coming into the uterine cavity, and you see, um, for things, right up here in the corner, or I'll tell you her background a bit. She'd had previous pre-cancer. It's called endometrial hyperplasia. She'd been given omegas for treatment, so to hormonally suppress the potential endometrial cancer. And then they kept giving her hormones and then biopsies and hormones and biopsies, and basically went through several years of this. And finally they said, okay, on the biopsies, everything is normal. Um, but they would occasionally find something and then they'd start all over again. Well, if you go with the hysteroscopy, you find that disease right there. There's really sort of these, all these blood vessels. There's some disease right up in here, everything like that. And what was happening, and this is a polyp that's on the smaller side, but that could also be a problem. For someone with previous pre-cancer, there's some more, again, right there. You don't want to be having, oh, there are some, you don't want to be having these things in the uterus. And so what was happening for her is she would actually get, and there's again the disease back there again. This is a person where she would get a blind biopsy 
and I'm sorry, the resolution is too low. They'd sample in the middle of the uterus here because they couldn't see, but that's where the catheter went. And the, then the disease up in this corner and up in this corner would be missed. Fortunately, it ended up not being cancer. But this was a woman where had any of this stuff um, been done and evaluated through hysteroscopy, they would have actually been able to pick it up and treat her years, and she wasn't getting this, wouldn't have gotten all this medication that made her gain weight, and they would have been much more accurate and effective in treating things. So people can have problems within the uterus that are missed with blind biopsy, they're missed with ultrasound, and if you go in, you can see it. And so again, as we get back to sort of some of the, this is some of the reasons why we do things, that we pick things up that others have missed, and if you're saying, okay, again, ultrasound to understand the ovaries, ultrasound with hysteroscopy to understand the uterus, and then the air bubbles to see if the tubes are open. Again, the true gold standard for the tubes is laparoscopy, but a lot of people pay 10,000 for the, they have a $10,000 surgery, but a $2,000 deductible, incisions, anesthesia, and some time for recovery. A lot of people are saying, hey, if you can figure out most of that with a 15 minute office procedure, that gets a lot of people where they want to be. Moreover, um, it's a sort of gentle, it's accurate, it's fast. Again, for the gentleness, um, you know, I talked about that where most people say it's a pap smear or less, um, with rare exception, uh, or not rare, but you would often say about 10%, and usually that's because of the underlying diagnosis where you're either trying to fix something or they have something meaningfully going on already, which is sort of making their experience different from that of the average person. You then also say, okay, you know, it's accurate. Again, we estimate that 98% of the time, that was a study we did, 98% of the time, if there was a blockage, we could pick that up. That's very important to be able to say, hey, if my tubes are blocked, you know, I know it. Now, sometimes the tubes will fool you. They'll act closed when they're actually open. And so you can also use a fluid from the ultrasound and all, explain that if you're ever undergoing it, um, for seeing how, um, whether fluid escaped through. And sometimes you have this disconnect where the bubbles didn't get through, but then fluid did. And we'll talk about when people fall in between for what that means for their chances. And particularly if the uterus is backwards tipped, sometimes it's harder to get the bubbles where they need to be. Um, so there are all kinds of things that we can um, still figure out even if it is the less than perfect conditions for things. So, and again, uh, the body isn't always easy, but the, the question isn't whether I think this test is perfect. I think it's really good. I think for what can be done in the office, I prefer this to the alternatives that are out there. But the question is, what's the alternative? And if you're saying you're going to laparoscopy with the costs, the risks, all those other things, that usually should not be a frontline approach. Similarly for HSG, for hysterosalpingogram, not only can that, I think that costs more for many people relative to the value of the information provided. Plus, people don't like x-rays unnecessarily and they, you know, they can have allergic reactions to the contrast and the, the dye is kind of sticky and all, all those types of things. I find this to be a more informative approach than a lot of the alternatives for things, which is why we tend to lean towards it. Um, and so that's how we can see a lot in a short period of time. The challenge is then what do you do about it? And if you find polyps, you want to remove the polyps. If you find infection, you want to get antibiotics. If you've got scarring of the uterus, you want to clear that away. If you have fusion of those bands or you have a septum, which is where the uterus didn't develop properly in the, um, as an embryo, we find out ways of sort of cutting that back to make a more unified uh, home for the baby, so to speak. There are all kinds of things that you can do for this. And I think that's the broader challenge for everyone. How do you understand where the body is so that you can fine tune it and ultimately get people where they need to be? And this is really one of the important concepts. You know, um, everyone worries about testing because they're like, oh my gosh, what if they find something? Well, here's the thing. If you've got something going on that's wrong, it's still there whether you've tested or not. The difference is can you learn and gain control and improve the body? And if even if you can improve the body, at least you know what you're working with so that you can make the right decisions for, hey, for what I'm doing, these are my chances in a month and uh, this is what I have to do 
um, in order to maximize the likelihood I get where I want to be. And so, you know, I generally find for the most part, people are pretty happy at the end of this because if they're normal, they're really happy they're normal. And if they're abnormal, they're like, oh my gosh, this has been going on for years. People have missed it. You know, how can I, uh, what do we have to do to, to make sure that things are okay and get it back to where it should be? And so in some ways, either way is good.